Good afternoon. Please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 49, and we will read verses 29 to 33. You know, Patrick Pierce was a leader of a movement in Ireland that opposed the British rule in the early 1920s. That movement, which he led, um, were considered, in, especially him, they were considered as rebels. And so Pat or Patrick and some other men who were members of that movement, they were put to death by firing squad. But days before he died, he wrote a letter to his mother. And in that letter, he said, This is the death I should have asked if God had given me the choice of all death. To die a soldier's death for Ireland and for freedom. You know, when we hear such phrase like dying a soldier's death, what they mean usually by it is to die a sacrificial death for the nation's greater purpose, for their country's greater purpose. Now, here's a question for us Christians, for the church. Are we also called to die that way? Is our greater purpose to be sacrificial? I would say yes, but specifically, is it for, say, the nation's growth or the nation's liberty? Are we called, really, to also die a soldier's death? Especially when you say Christians, you're dealing with sacrifice. You're, you're talking about sacrificial, being sacrificial, right? But is it sacrificial in a sense like dying a, a, a soldier's death? Or should we die a saint's death? I hope and I pray that we would understand and we would have a better perspective when it comes to death and that God would help us this afternoon. And so let us read chapter 49, verses 29 to 33. It says, All these, sorry, verse 29, Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittite. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. The grass withered, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Now, I want to begin by going back to the time when God gave his promise to Abraham. And we must go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And by summary, if you remember, God has given this promise to Abraham that God will give Abraham a land, that God would give, that God will make of Abraham a great nation, which meant that he will have many descendants that he will be a father of many nations, right? So we can see that, in a sense, having two elements of the pro promise, the land and descendants. Sometimes they're overlap. But we can say that God promised Abraham a land and uh, for him to have many descendants. Now, again, God will give Abraham a land he will be a father to many nations, to many descendants. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he will have descendants as many as the sand in the sea. Now, that's Genesis chapter 12, repeated in Genesis 15, also in Genesis chapter 17. But now we're in Genesis chapter 49. Abraham is, past, Abraham is dead. Isaac already died. Same promise were extended from Abraham to Isaac to now Jacob. Now Jacob, as you can see in Genesis chapter 49, before he dies, his last words, 
you see in his last words, it is evident we will see the promises of God. We can say that the promises of God were evident in Jacob's last word. Jacob wants to be buried where? His, his, his request was very specific. I am to be gathered to my people. Where is that? Bury me with my fathers, the place where his fathers were. Where is that? In the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. This was the cave owned by Ephron the Hittite, which Abraham has bought so he could bury Sarah when Sarah died. That is in Genesis chapter 23. Where exactly is this? It is, it, it is that cave that is in the field at Machpelah. Where? To the east of Mamre. Where? In the land of Cana. It's like Jacob wants to make sure, right? Bury me doon, 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 doon. Okay? Right? He wants to remind his descendants of the promise of God. Remember that the land of promise. Don't bury me here. Bury me there. So again, you'll see the promise of God evident in his last words. In his last command to his sons, he wanted to be buried in the promised land. But not only that, again, I said that there were, in a sense, two elements to this, right? Descendants. Remember that God promised Abraham descendants, a nation, a family. And we can also see that in, his, in Jacob's last request in Genesis chapter 49, right? There they buried who? Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac, Rebekah. And even Leah, Jacob acknowledged God's promise in his last request. He did not want to be buried in Egypt. He wants to be buried in the land of promise. He did not want to be buried together with other Egyptians. He wanted to be buried where the people of God were. You see here the faith of Jacob, right? Proclaimed. He wants to proclaim his faith even in his death. He wants to be known, most, most importantly, by his sons, as a, th that he lived a life having faith in his God, even though he's already gone. He believed God's promise that God will give the land of Canaan to them. This is Jacob publicly acknowledging what God will do in the future. Bury me where my descendants will live for many, many years. Not here. Yes, we will stay in Egypt for many more years. But he believes that God will free them from Egypt in the future and bring them back to the land of Christ. That, that's the faith that Jacob had. And his faith, I would say, enabled him to die well. Based on his actions, based on how he handled himself here, it does look like, it does look like Jacob was well prepared to die. You know, death is usually something we think about when we attend memorial services. In fact, we don't remember death. We only remember death whenever we gather together for a wake service. It's not something that you think about every day. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you don't think about death immediately. But you're confronted and you, are, uh, you remember the reality of death whenever we are attending a, serve, a memorial service. We don't think about it every day. It's not in our everyday thought. And yet, it is the one thing that is certain. It has been said that life is uncertain. You don't know what's coming at you. But there's one thing certain, and it is death. And now, this is something that we all have in common. We're all going to die. So can we say, just like Jacob here, who I believe was ready to die. He believes that his death will not annul the promise of God. His death will not cancel 
what God has already said. If God said it, he believes that God will do it even though he's not around anymore. He's so ready to go. Can we also say that we're ready to go? Are we prepared to die? Are we prepared to die well? And seeing the faith of Jacob here, do we have the same faith? Do we have the same faith that we're in fact in good hands, even though we doubt? Do we believe in the promise of God that this, was, this, is, go, this is what's going to happen when you die? Do we believe it? A faith that enables one to see death in a better perspective, in a biblical perspective, I would say, a faith that enables us to die well. Why is it even important to die well? Why the need to prepare for death? Because it would also enable us to live well here on earth. Um, a Puritan, Rich, Richard Baxter, who said, um, the possession is there, the preparation is here. Most especially for us, for us who understand salvation, for us who understood what Christ has done for us, who believe in the saving work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are many reasons for us to be prepared and for us to die well. And so my message this afternoon is that faith in Christ enables us to die well. Faith in Christ enables us to die well. And dying well would mean two things as seen in our passage today. And I have two points. First, a better future. Second, a comforting truth. A better future and a comforting truth. Let's get the point. A better future. And so, after Jacob gives his benediction to his sons, uh, we, as we have studied in the past weeks, he has given his last messages to each and every uh, one of his sons. He commanded them for the last time. It's at verse 29. I am to be gathered to my people. That's what he said. Bury me with my father. Now, if you read it, it would seem as if he wants to be gathered where the other family members were buried. I mean, there's truth in that. I mean, at face value, if you read it as it is, you'll understand it that way. And again, that is true. To be buried where Abraham, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah were. But that is not what this primarily means. Verse, let's go to verse 33. Verse 33 tells us that when Jacob finished commanding his sons, it says here, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his feet. Just like what he said. He wants to be gathered with his people, and yet the moment he died, the Bible says he was gathered to his people already. Again, take note that when Jacob breathed his last, he wasn't buried yet. And by the way, Canaan was a long drive. drive. Uh, malayo ang uh, wala pang drive noon. Long walk. Yan. Malayo. Kaya nga in Genesis 50, makikita natin, he will be mummified, he will be preserved in order for them to, be, to bury Jacob. And yet, he wasn't buried yet, by the way. He, he wasn't buried yet. And the Bible says, He's gathered to his people. What does this mean? So Jacob, when he said, I am to be gathered to my people, he meant not a physical gathering, although it also means that. He meant not a physical gathering of dead bodies, but an actual gathering with those who have passed away. Richard Phillips had this to say. And I quote, Jacob had died in the expectation of joining his people in heaven. He did die, and he was gathered to them. That's what's being said. And 
Also, Matthew Henry, in his commentary, he said this, and I quote, His separated soul went to the assembly of the souls of the faith, which after they are delivered from the burden of the flesh are in joy and felicity. If God's people be our people, death will gather us to them as well. And so Matthew Henry was saying, right after Jacob breathed his last, definitely he was with Abraham. He was with Rebekah and Isaac. He was gathered to them. There's a gathering of the saints in the life to come after that. Of course, in their time, they were, in a sense, they were experiencing joy already in the realm of the dead, waiting for Christ to return, to get them all together and bring them to heaven. Hence, a new covenant, a believer now, when we die, we don't go anymore to the realm of the dead, but we go immediately to Christ. But there's still joy in the realm of the dead in where they were. They were still gathered with joy and felicity. It means that there is a better time. There's a, there's a better gathering of a holy community. Better than this, the, the kind of gathering that they had before. He was looking forward to it. I am to be gathered. I'm looking forward to a better gathering. But the point here is not just the gathering, brethren. The point here is that these saints, saints of old, look forward to something greater. They were looking forward to something greater. They were not looking forward to be gathered in grave. They were looking forward to a holier gathering. They were, looking, they were not just looking forward to a physical land, which was Canaan, which is called the land of milk and honey. Yes, it is blessed having riches and resources, yet they were looking ahead. Hebrews chapter 11 says that Abraham was in fact looking for the heavenly city. These saints of old were looking for something greater when they were alive. In fact, scriptures always compare our earthly lives to what is to come. And scriptures use words that would Remind us that what is to come is, in fact, incomparable to now. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is, reve that is to be revealed to us. And Paul here is saying that when you are suffering that... You may be experiencing suffering in this present time, but take note that there is, that, that what you are going through, it's incomparable to the glory that you will have. It's not yet revealed to us, clarifies that in, in Romans chapter 8, but it will be revealed to us with Christ's return. He also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he, in fact, gives a charge to the church by saying, do not be afraid. Or in other, in other translations, do not lose heart. And he said, and he makes a comparison. Though our outer self is wasting away. And that is, by the way, true. Whether you're sick or not. Whether we have any ailment or not. It is true. Our outer self is wasting away. We're getting old. We're getting weaker. It is wasting away. However, Paul says our inner self is being renewed day by day. Through the means of God, means of grace, we are becoming holier and holier in Christ. And then Paul says, for this light, so he, he gives a com comparison. For this light momentary affliction, to so see, whatever affliction that we are experiencing on earth, he calls it first light. 
and momentary. And he compares it to what? An eternal, right? Eternal. Not bound by time. And then he says, weight of glory beyond all comparison. That is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, by the way, who is who who in, during that time had that uh, information or who has seen the testimony of Christ, who has been given the eyes to see what Christ has done. How about Jacob? How about the Old Testament saints? They did not know yet the full picture. And yet they looked forward to the future and saw it greater than what they had before. Paul also said, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You see the comparison there. When Jacob said, I am to be gathered to my people, he's saying, he's going to be gathered together with his people in heaven. To be with the faithful. He's looking forward. He wasn't just looking forward to be together in the grave, rather to be together with those who have faith, to be together in heaven. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, he's one of those faithful. He's one of those listed there in Hebrews chapter 11 as the faithful uh, disciples or the faithful believers, rather, of God. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16, let me read. These all died in faith. Not having received the things promised, they did not receive it during their lifetime, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. It says here in Hebrews chapter 11, they weren't just thinking of the land of Canaan because if they're thinking of that, I mean just that, they could easily just return there. What's the, They're desiring for the heavenly land. And it says, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is the God of strangers and exile, for he has prepared for them a city. And so dying well means dying with the hopes that dying is not the end for us. Rather, it is our entrance into glory, entrance into a indeed a better future. That the life to come is indeed better. Now, we can't be pessim pessimistic in a sense that there's no victory here at all. We're not saying that. Christ has won. And Christ has begun building, or he has brought the new creation already. He's building the church. Christ has won. Christ accomplished victory over sin. And death, there is victory now in Jesus Christ, but there is also truth in a sense that we will experience greater things after death. And it is far greater than what we are experiencing now. I mean, a life without sin isn't that greater? A life without hurt? Isn't that greater? A life seeing the face of God? And when we say seeing the face of God, it means there is a, an absolute increase in our knowledge of God, that our souls will see God. And when we die, there is that immediate increase of knowledge and information about God that we did not know before. And yet, it is an increase in knowledge that continuously increases in eternity. Isn't that a greater life? I'm not saying that now is not a great life. 
imagine a life knowing God in a way we couldn't know before. And it is an increasing knowing of Him in eternity. Now, not one of us can get there to that heavenly land. Because of sin, what we deserve is the opposite. What is to come for those who have no faith in Christ is worse than the worst thing that you know that has happened here on earth. Think of the worst thing that has happened here on earth. It's worse because it is an eternity of experiencing the wrath of God towards them. But because of Jesus Christ, we will escape such wrath. And we deserve it. We deserve it. But we will escape it. Christ lived a sinless life. It was him who lived that way that we cannot live. And he died a sacrificial death. And he rose again from the dead. And because of him, we will be graced with eternal life. Instead of eternal wrath that we deserve. And so if you are not in Christ and you do not believe in him, I plead to you, repent now of your sins. Take this seriously and ponder before it's too late. Repent of your sins and come to faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you know what? There is no other way. There is no other way. Christ is the only way. But again, for those who are in Christ, we are to look forward to what is to come. Not because of the plague. And I'm sure we, our imaginations, imaginations are working right now. Ano kaya itura talaga nun? Is it true na maraming ginto doon that we're gonna walk in uh, stones, yung mga kumikinang na bato, ganun kaya yun? I'm not saying na totoo yun. It's not because of the place. Oh yes, God, Christ said He has prepared a place for us. But it's not the place that makes it greater. What makes heaven greater is because of the presence of our Savior. And that's ultimately what the old saints were looking forward to. This is the kind of faith Jacob had that enabled him to die well. That for one who has faith in Christ, dying becomes an actual transition into something greater. The, the question is, do we have that same hope? That we believe that this life here is not the end. That we're going to a better place. That our faith now will become sight. There will come a time that our faith will become sight. And there will come a time that we will, more, that we will all the more appreciate what Christ has done when we get there. But see, this is not a, just a call to have, you know, to have that mind and think about the future. No, because this would help you in how you live now. And so the challenge for us is to live now with an expectation of a greater life in Christ to come. Live now with an expectation of a greater life to come. This is how we prepare for the inevitable, which is death. It is to live a life setting our minds on things above and not on things that are on earth. It is to live a life in appreciation for Christ's work that none of this is possible if not for Christ. This is living a life of optimism. And when we say optimism, this is not, oh, just think happy thoughts. And you try to think of things that would make you happy so you believe, you'll be optimistic at the moment. No. Paul said, set your minds. Paul said, set your affections. It means desiring to possess what is already yours. It's right. So this is something objective. It's not, kumbaga parang nagiging subjective ka lang na gusto mo lang maging masaya, so think happy thoughts. You don't even know what those, hap those thoughts are. 
set your mind on the things above. It is a life having an understanding that when you leave this earth, you are to transition into the incomparable eternal weight of glory. To a time when there's no sickness. To a time when there's no sin. Most importantly, to a time when you will see the Lord. A time when you would all the more appreciate the work of Christ. And again, the Puritan Richard Baxter beautifully shares this thought to us in his, in his writing called Dying Thoughts. And he said, and I quote, I shall know what measure of grace myself had and how far I was mistaken concerning it. I shall know more of the number and greatness of my sin and of my obligation to pardoning and healing grace. Once more, I shall better know from what enemies, sins, and dangers I was here delivered, what stratagems of Satan and his instruments God defeated, how many snares I escaped, and how great my deliverance by Christ from the wrath to come is. And so he's saying, when we get this, and this is why it is greater, now we have a better appreciation and understanding to the sin where kumbaga yung mga kasalanan natin na kung saan din deliver tayo ni Christ ngayon may mas appreciate may mas appreciate tayo when we get mas maintindihan natin yung kalaliman yung gravity of our sins when we get there i mean we can we 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 can understand the gravity of our sins now but not to the extent when we get there now we understand ganito pala ka bigat ganito pala ka, ka kalalim yung grasya ng Panginoon at ganun pala, kagrabe yung kasalanan ko noon. It will be a time when you would truly realize the mercy and grace of God. Again, I'm not saying that we will not realize that now, but you would all the more realize it when we're together with Christ. You would appreciate all the more Christ's deliverance from sin. You would say, hindi ko to deserve you would appreciate all the more Christ's blessing, that Christ's blessing is more than your current understanding. Kung bagay understanding natin ngayon of blessing of Christ, it is overflowing. And we usually say that, right? If you are in Christ, you are a recipient of an, the overflowing blessings of Christ. But when we say that now, comparing to what we're really going to receive in the future, I mean, yung statement na yon, the term overflowing blessing is really an understatement. That is what awaits us, my brethren. Thanks to Christ. But also, you know, especially as we talk about our lives now, may this expectation of what is to come, of eternity future, help us in our bout against sin. I mean now. Knowing that there will be a time when sin will be gone. Knowing that it will have an end, it will finally be defeated. It, in fact, has been defeated, will be defeated. May that give you strength, brethren. It would make us desire for that time, desire for the coming of Christ, because these things will happen when He returns. So, are we not looking forward for Christ's return? Are we looking forward to that time? In fact, are we desiring it? Not to the point that we will do something bad. But while we're living here on earth, in fact, are we desiring that eternal weight of glory that awaits? And that should excite a Christian now. And that should affect the life of a Christian now. That should affect your ministry to others. That should affect your evangelism. You would be more, you would want to evangelize more people because you know what's going to happen. You would be more zealous in defeating the sin that keeps you weary. Or is our grip on the earthly thing here too tight? 
our riches, our status, that we don't even look forward anymore to what lies ahead. Just rito. It's not an issue of contentment. That's a different issue. But the fact is, I mean, ayaw natin makawala sa kung ano mang meron tayo ngayon. Masyadong tight ang grip natin sa mga earthly things, whereas Paul says, focus on the heaven. We need to repent of such. So are we looking forward to what is to come? The challenge is for us, again, to live now with an expectation of a greater life to come. But you know what? While we are looking forward to what is to come, while we are here, what else should our disposition be? Let's go to the second point, a comforting truth. Now, I want to begin the second point by going back to the life of Jacob. Because we are in his last passage, in the, in the passage that we would last see Jacob. Remember that Jacob lived a life of difficulty. He grew up, remember he grew up seeing his father Isaac, loving his older brother more than him, Esau. And because of that favoritism, siya din, nagkaroon siya ng favorite sa kanyang mga anak, right? Joseph. That also affected his fatherhood. And that caused relationship problems too. Within the brothers, but also most importantly, kay Jacob. What else? He was hunted by his own brother Esau. In fact, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. He then lived in Laban's home for, I mean, he, he just wanted seven years. And then it extended up to 20 plus years. He was deceived by Laban. And then he had problems with his two wives na pinag-aagawan siya, Leah, Rachel. He had problems with his own sons. He lived his life from that point on. When he met God, he became limp. And we understood that from that time on, limp na siya. Up to the end of his life. And not only that, and I think the worst thing that has happened to him when it was when the time he learned about his son, Joseph. He thought that Joseph died and was murdered or killed by an animal, rather. And so he lived that kind of life. But despite that, God was definitely with Jacob. We see also in his life, hindi lang yung mga difficulties, but the graces of God. God wrestled with Jacob to see that Jacob must be dependent on God alone. Not only that, God renamed Jacob as Israel. God touched the hip of Jacob. God preserved Jacob and his sons. These were the things. These, there were many things that God has done to remind Jacob of God's faithfulness. And so having that as a context, having that in mind, having in mind a summary of a life full of challenges, full of difficulties, a life of having remaining sins, but also a life of being with God. We come now to the end of his life in verse 33. He drew up his... Imagine a, a full life of worries, challenges, difficulties, and now he, now he comes to this point where he can just rest. He says, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. He spent years of heavy burden, years with sin, but also with the grace from God. Now it's time to just draw up his feet into the bed. We see here the calmness that Jacob had. It's like saying, I'm done. Indeed, I'm done in a bad way. Or it's done. I've lived my life. Like he's expecting what's going to happen next, which is death. He knows it's going to come. And yet, he wasn't panicking. Oh, I'm going to die. What, 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 what do I do? No, he drew up his feet into the bed. And see how I also say it? Very calm. He was calm. It was a time of rest. He's about to go to a state where there's no sin. It's now time to meet his maker. 
again, Richard Phillip had this to say, and I'd like to quote him. He said, I think it's wonderful that the last movement of Jacob's traveled life was an act of faith. He didn't struggle with the thought of dying, so he calmly composed himself to wait for the Lord. End quote. Another commentator whose name was Robert Candlish, he said, and I quote, There can be no doubt that these words denote a calm and peaceful close to the patriarch's troubled career. End quote. Very calm. He sees death, and I would use the words of Paul, as gain. Now, of course, not everyone has the same privilege of having this kind of peace at the moment of death. I'm talking about the privilege of such peaceful kind of death. Not everyone. But we're not talking about preparing for that moment. We're talking here about what if we die now? There must be due preparation now. There must be a change of perspective when it comes to death now so that whenever it happens, and we may not be aware that it would happen, we're good to go. We'll be ready. Are we comforted by the fact that death is not the end? Or are we, and this is the common struggle when it, when it comes to the topic of death, are we afraid? Jacob was not. Are we, are we afraid of death? And being afraid of death is in fact common to mankind because there's this fear of the unknown. What's going to happen next? That one is afraid of a possibility of not having the same comfort that we're currently having now when we're together, when you're with family and loved ones, that when one dies, you won't be with them anymore. And so there's fear. But for a Christian, there is comfort because we know what's ahead. We know. We are, in fact, called, Paul said, to not lose heart. Meaning, to not be afraid. Of death. Because we can approach death and live life now with assured heart. That when God takes away our earthly life, it is gain for us. Because to die for us means to be with Christ. And because of our remaining sins, we are fearful. And yet the Bible continuously assures us assures us, do not lose heart, do not lose heart. Fear not, fear not. We need not to be afraid because there is life after our earthly life. In fact, there is no seizing of life. It is because of what Christ has accomplished. And that is the only reason why we must have such hope. We must, touch, we must have such comfort and assurance. If not for Christ, then all of this is in vain. Yes, death is the end. But Christ lived. Christ lived a sinless life for us. He died for us. He rose again for us. In fact, you know what? Christ's death is in fact better than Jacob's death. Jacob did not control over his did not have control over his death. He knew that it's gonna come. He's aware of his coming death, but his death was not like Christ. Christ alone had the authority to actually give up his life, to yield up his life. Not only that, Christ's death is better than Jacob's death because Jacob's death did not accomplish anything. But death, the death of the greater Jacob, Jesus Christ, accomplished for us, for you and I, eternal life. Through his death, he has disarmed the power of death. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 15? 
verses 54 to 56, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thank be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will not remain dead because Christ lived. It has no sting. It has no power over us anymore. In his death on the cross, in his resurrection, Christ defeated enemy that is death. And that you and I do not experience second death. And Christ will finally defeat, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, last enemy, which is a death. He will finally defeat it in his return. I'd say it's the kind of faith Jacob had that enabled him to die well. He had faith in the promise of God that there's a better blessing that was to come, and that blessing was Christ. And in our time, he has come. And we are indeed called to die well, to have the same confidence, the same comfort, most importantly for us to understand the gospel. And so my last challenge, brethren, is do not be afraid of death. Find comfort now in Christ. No, do not be afraid of death. Find comfort now in Christ. This is a call not to be careless in life, but this is a call to be more dependent upon the promises of God. Find comfort now. It benefits us now. I know it's not easy to do. Because we are naturally afraid of death. Especially when you're in that situation when you're physically weak, you're sick, you're more vulnerable to the enemy's attack, and you'll definitely be afraid. But fear is usually a result of doubt. There is doubt as to what God says about heaven, about what God says about eternity. But let the gospel assure you, brethren. The gospel gives us more reason to find comfort than be afraid. Find comfort now in Christ, who delivered those who through fear of death were subjects to the slavery of sin all their lives, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. It says that even those who fear death, Christ has delivered them. Christ has delivered us, not just from death, but also from our fear of death. Find comfort now that Jesus Christ himself desires for us to be with him in glory. I mean, wouldn't that give you comfort? That when we die, and we will, It is actually the prayer of Christ in John chapter 17. For those who are his to be with me in glory. He, in fact, in his prayer to God the Father, he says, it is my desire for them to be with me in glory. Find comfort that your Savior wants to be with you in glory. Find comfort also that when that happens, it is in fact the Father answering the prayer of the Son. It means the death of a saint is an answered prayer. This is why it is precious in the sight of God. The Puritan Thomas Brooks died of an illness and his friends have known him and have said in their testimonies of Brooks that he has strong faith. Now, before he died, it was Thomas Brooks who said this quote, A believer's dying day is his best day. And why then should he be unwilling to die? And he's not saying, he's not, hindi niya, uh, hindi encourage yung mga tao mamatay. But it's giving us a better perspective of death. That in fact, death, if you understand what it is, it will be your best day. Do we have the same comfort to even say that? Do we have the same assurance that our death will in fact be our best day? For on that day when we, when we close our eyes, we say goodbye to the earthly things, and even to our 
loving family members and churchmates, friends, but we will open our eyes to the sight of Christ. Do we fear death? Do we doubt God's promises about eternal life? If you have these struggles, remember the gospel. This is how to die a saint's death. Faith in Christ enable, enables us to die well. Live now with an expectation of a greater life to come and do not be afraid of death. Find comfort in the Lord Jesus. May the word of God enrich our knowledge of him and may it stir us to live in light of Jesus. Let us pray. Our most high God and heavenly Father, we are grateful for the work of Christ in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that he died on the cross and he has willingly received your wrath, which he, oh Lord, and he rose again from the dead. Lord, it is us who are deserving of such wrath. Lord, Christ is our advocate. And because of Christ, you see Christ's righteousness in us. And Lord, we are so thankful that because of it, you have accepted us. You have forgiven us of our sin. And because of what Christ has done, because of his defeat, because he has defeated sin and death, we too died to sin and we will not experience second death. Lord, may we have a better perspective of death. May we be not afraid of death. May we see it as our entrance into glory. And may we look forward of a life that is greater. May we appreciate his work. And so thank you, O Lord. And thank you for the opportunity to partake of the bread and wine. May the visible gospel truly sanctify each and every one of us. We thank you and we praise you in Christ. Amen.